The topic of our lecture today will touch two main pillars of everyday life here in Israel, where I'll try to give you information, but not just information of what's happening now, rather a deep historic context uh, that will help us understand the roots of what's happening today in Israel. Because if we only look at the incidents happening from a very narrow point of view, or if we only look at them out of context as a single event missing the history, then we won't know how to counter anti-Israel sentiments that come out of it. So I'll in one hand be explaining to you exactly what's happening on a daily basis in Israel, but also try to analyze together with you um, where the roots of this terrorism come from. In the end of the lecture, I'm also going to touch a little bit, and then we'll open it up to discussion. I'm also going to touch a little bit regarding the political unrest here in Israel, because everything, as you know, including in Australia, is connected. Security is connected with, with political a, a unrest and vice versa, and I think that's something which is important for us to talk about. Terrorism in Israel has a common root, only the reality changes. That would be, that is the main pillar and nuance that I want to touch on this evening. We can prove, I will try to prove to you, that while the environment may change and the way terrorism affects Israelis may change, the core root and the core of the conflict has always remained the same. And it's with this information that I hope to, in the end of the lecture, also give you the ability to tell you where I think you can have an impact for the good. So before I do that, and sorry, before I do that, uh, just a little bit about my background. It was spoken, so I'm going to say it uh, very, very, sorry. So I'll be very, very uh, brief about it. So I called it my Israeli and Australian story. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that like every Jewish child, I do everything in my capacity to make my mother proud. And it's not a very, very easy task that I to do. I have to tell you, I failed with it many times, but I was grew up in a modern Orthodox family in Israel, parents who made Aliyah, one from Boston, one from Chicago, were inspired by Zionism in the 1970s. And then in the 1980s came to, to make their home there grew up a child with learning disabilities, severe uh, complexities in school, but always had a passion both for speaking and for learning and trying to bring uh, those two things uh, together. I would say that the moment of catharsis, the moment that changed my life, one that I spoke about also in the Yom Zikaron event, which was compelling and emotional for me as well, um, was in 2014, where a year, two years before that I studied in yeshiva, an idealistic child, great dreams, great passion with an enormous thunder in my eyes. And in Operation 14, due to endless missile attacks sent by Gaza into Israel and Hamas terror tunnels that were dug underground with the attempt to kill and butcher as many Israeli citizens as possible on our southern border, which borders with Gaza, I was sent together with my uh, brigade, with the Golani Brigade, into the neighborhood of Sajaiya, which at the time was the strongest highhold of Hamas, with the mission of dismantling the Hamas terrorist tunnels that were there. Our operation was postponed in 24 hours because the IDF feared that civilians, and knew that civilians are being held as hostage in the other side, therefore not allowing us to have enough a, a artillery and air force firing into the city prior to, to ground brutes going in. So the IDF made a decision. One can disagree if it's the right decision or wrong. What's important for me that you know, and that young people in Australia know, and that programs like this always know that there is a fact. The IDF postponed the attack of my unit so that the other side's as civilians can be saved, therefore endangering many of us. Seven of my friends were killed that evening, many of them before my eyes, something that impacted my life tremendously. But it also changed it. From a child who thought he'd make his mother proud by being a lawyer, I realized that I want to come into one of the worst vacuums and dissonances that I think the Jewish world is experiencing. And that is Israel, the, Jew the one and only Jewish nation state um, image problem. See, after, except the psychological aftermath, I saw the first reports of the UN, Human Rights Council, etc., that were talking specifically about my unit and about the conflict in Sajaiya that I was in. 
calling us war criminals. I see social media calling us animals and baby killers. And although I understand social media and understand identity politics and realize that not everything has to do with a rationale conversation, there's sometimes genuine hate, sometimes identity, which makes people say things at times which don't make sense with the rationale only due to a tribal affiliation, and sometimes just ignorance. Um, I realize that Israel's image problem is a personal problem. It's not just the problem of my country. It's what's being said about me and my friends, including my friends who, uh, of course, they didn't make it out of there. And it's what's being said about the Jewish world. It's also a threat to Jewish identity. You, of course, and the Zionist Council in New South Wales, I know understands this a, a very well and in a very deep way. So I decided to go into the worlds of pro-Israel advocacy content and also political uh, consulting. And I've done so in college campus and in other places which Rodney spoke about. So no reason to elaborate more about that. What I was supposed to talk to you about is Israel changing identity. I, in my analysis, not only my analysis, this has been spoken about and also um, been the, the topic of conversation by many. And many times when it comes to the conversation about Israel and about the conversation of the trends that make young people have an opinion worldwide, we're mistaken. We we're not touching the actual issue that interests young people and almost all people in the world, sometimes without even then noticing. And there's actually a lot of research about this. And that is the issue of identity. I believe that although being said that the number one factor for anti-Israel bias is can be anti-Semitism or social media rhetoric. I actually think that the component of identity the, is, the, is the one number one factor of the way young people make decisions. It's not anymore about an intellectual debate or about just giving one the facts. It's about what I want to belong to. That's what makes many of us vote. That's what makes many of us purchase a certain item. And it definitely gives people opinions about Israel at times for the good and at times for the bad. So what I wanted to do originally, and we will do that in, in, in the next session, is to speak to you about Israel's changing identity. What identity politics looks like in Israel from a country that was a melting pot to a country that in its essence today is multicultural and is trying to embrace all the tribes of Israel and some tribes who are not part of the tribes of Israel into one inclusive society hoping that by the through the conversation of identity, we can have also a new conversation with young people worldwide due to the fact that this is the issue that interests them. And this is the language that interests them. And if we don't speak their language, then Jewish education and pro-Israel advocacy becomes like a Babylon building. Two people speaking a different language. And that's something that I want to gap and hope to gap uh, together with you who are working on all these important works on a daily basis. Let's start speaking a little bit and I'll get to what's happening in Israel at, at this moment, but I want you to get there through a context so that when you read an article like the ridiculous articles that we've been seeing analyzing the situation in Israel in the past few, uh, in the past few weeks, you can have a context. You can have the confidence to speak with young people in the community, to speak on social media, to, to write reports to, to the articles and even just for yourself to know exactly what the situation is. And I wanna start by the biggest myth that I think exists when it comes to the continual and systematic terrorizations of Israelis in the land of Israel and in the one and only Jewish state. And that, and to do so, I wanna demonstrate through a person called Aaron Herschler. And I don't know if you've heard about him, but he is considered, in Israel, as the first victim of, of Arab terrorism in Israel, it wasn't at that time Palestinian terrorism per se, of Arab terror, of Arab Muslim, sorry, a, a terrorism in the state of Israel. Aaron Erschler was a student in Yeshiva in Jerusalem who was murdered in 1872 in Mishkenot Anim in the neighborhood just outside the walls of Jerusalem by Palestinian terrorists who dragged him out of his house and shot him to death. Now, the reason that I think this is so important and the reason I, I want this person to stand always in front of your eyes is because when you will hear people telling you that the events that are happening in Tel Aviv in the past few days 
are due to a territorial dispute that started in 1967. And they come in a context of some national legitimate dispute as if it's a Northern Ireland scenario, then I want you to remember that already in 1872, a Jewish yeshiva bachar much before 1967, much before, was murdered for being a Jew in the land of Israel. The problem of terrorism, the root of terrorism from Aaron Herschler to those who were murdered in Tel Aviv, and that's the timeline that I want you to go through, that root has always been the same. No acceptance or legitimacy for any Jewish presence in the land of Israel in any territory. And I'm not a simplistic person. I really try not to be. And Israeli politics, people can dispute about many things. And, I, and you know, we're a democracy and we have disagreements. And I don't always agree with my government. But it really is not in any way, shape, or form a propaganda uh, to say that, that Arab Muslim terrorism has been a center, has been in the center of the history of the land of Israel way before 1967. So look up Aaron Herschler. And just so you know, on Yom Zikaron, which is Yom Zikaron, not only for the IDF fallen, but also for the, uh, for the terror victims, the first terror victim calculated is, uh, is Aaron Herschler, the Yeshiva Bachar, and that's how the counting began. Let me take you through a slight timeline. Now, I'll tell you that I, I built this timeline, so you can also challenge it and disagree with me what the main pillars of, of uh, Islamic terrorism in Israel and later on Palestinian terrorism in Israel is, um, is it throughout history. But I wanted to, cho to choose and pinpoint a few events so that you can have in your heads a timeline of what exactly is happening in 22. And while you can see, and that's why I gave the lecture, the headline that I gave, you can see that the way or that these atrocities are happening and taking place in Israel change, it seems very obviously that the route between Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv and Aaron Herschler, a yeshiva buffer in Jerusalem, much before the state of Israel was established, is the same. So just briefly, let me talk about it a little bit. And I chose to start it in 1929, even though we have atrocities before, basically from the beginning of Zionism, from when this idea in Europe came, that the Jews came to a conclusion, national Jews came to a conclusion that the way to solve the, the, the Jewish problem is by creating a nation state, one that embodies in it, not only Aliyah and having a Jewish majority, but needs to be the center of our culture. Something that young Jews in Sydney should look at, not only from a victimhood point of view, but also a place so they can apply their identity so that they can be strong Jews in Australia. They need a strong sovereign identity Jewish state in Israel. Since that idea came to, to birth, that there, it hasn't been accepted in the land of Israel. Already in between 1929 and 1935, we had horrendous atrocities, which basically looked like pogroms. There were some in Tiberias, there were some all over. Um, and the main one, the most famous one, is the Hebron massacre in 1925. And this took place from 1925, basically till 1935. Um, th these endless atrocities through the British mandate and through the, what, what's called the white books, the white books to those who don't know are basically the frame of work of which the British decided who can immigrate into the land of Israel. And that was crucial for both sides, both for the Arab side and for the Israeli side, because that would dictate who would have a, the majority. Between 1936 and 1939, due to some more pro-Zionist, um, also thanks to Jews worldwide, just to remind you of the impact of a strong Jewish community worldwide, the British mandate sort of became a little more pro-Zionist in terms of immigration. So the Arab revolt began resulting in horrendous terror attacks, murders, stabbings, and, sh and shooting throughout the land of Israel. Not only soldiers, which is bad enough, but pinpointed uh, at citizens on a daily basis. The state of Israel was declared, we had the independence war, and then we go into 1951, which is the beginning of the attacks of the Fadayun. The Fadayun are basically militant groups. Many of them came from Egypt and Gaza. And remind you, Gaza at the time was a part of Egypt, but a, a now, of course, a major city of the Palestinians run by Hamas. 
they basically um, um, attacks of, this, of the Fadayun, they would come into Kibbutzim, Nachal Oz, for instance, in the middle of the night, kill people. One of the most famous speeches that Moshe Dayan gave is a eulogy to a person named Roi Rotenbil, an Israeli kibbutznik who was murdered by, by Arab Muslims in, um, in, uh, that came in as a part of the Fadayun attacks in uh, the 1950s. Israel then went into the war of the Sinai in order to kick back and push back to the Sinai Peninsula, uh, the terrorists of the Fadayun. So remind you again, regardless of what international community is saying and how they're putting things out of context as to try and show it as a small, you know, root of disagreement that we have the Palestinian about some territory, it was pretty clear to the Palestinians themselves in the 1950s that the problem isn't 1967, but the problem is the entire Israel. That's not a political view I'm trying to say about the future of the settlements. That we can debate about. But it is a categorical fact of history that I'm trying to present to you here uh, before, before your eyes. 1970 to 1987 is a time that many forgotten, maybe you didn't, but my generation, unfortunately or fortunately forgot, is the beginning of a horrendous PLO, which is the Palestinian Liberation Organization, attacks against Israel. Now, just in a short biography, I wanna remind you, the leader of the PLO, one of the people who was in charge of the murder of the most Jews in history, Yasser Arafat, he basically was born in Egypt, moved to East Jerusalem, started terrorizing there, and then moved to Jordan, started doing problems in Jordan. So the Jordanian king kicked him into Lebanon. And then he started creating murder, it, murderous attacks against Israelis. Remind you, today, the war with Lebanon is Hezbollah. But at the time, the problem of Lebanon was not Hezbollah. Hezbollah didn't exist, the militant Shia group, I mean. What existed is the PLO, who were vanished from Jordan to Lebanon and were doing some of the most horrendous attacks and acts of terror against Israelis. Were they doing it in the settlements because it's a territorial dispute? Not only, which is bad enough. Of course not. One of the most famous incidents is the murder of, of kids in a high school in Maalot. Another famous incident, a guy named Samir Kuntar, who eventually was assassinated by Israel, comes into the city of Nariya, killing a family of five, the Haran family, during those years. And eventually, due to these endless attacks and missile firing on our northern border, Israel went into the Lebanon war to kick out the Palestinian Authority from there and send them to Tunisia. They travel a lot, the terrorists, as you see. Eventually, during the Oslo Accords, they will be brought back to Israel. Then we're coming into the more institutionalized, famous uh, moments, and that is 1987 to 1990 to 91 is basically the first intifada. Now, what is an intifada? The, Pal the intifada is an uprising, a Palestinian uprising. But what it really is is you're going to hear many times on the news people telling you that terrorism doesn't represent the other side or the enemy. It's a few people making wrong decisions. The intifada says exactly the opposite. The Intifada is an institutionalized, strategic decision of the Palestinian Authority, those perceived to be the moderates, let me remind you, to go and terrorize and to, and to have violence against civilians, against any international law in the most brutal and unbelievable a, a way possible. At this time, it was only in Israel, the terrorist attack, but eventually we know that it only starts in Israel. And that's why it's so important for you to see this history because it touches ultimately Australia. We know it touches America. What starts in Israel, we say in Hebrew, so the opposite here, what starts in Israel doesn't end in Israel. And we need to always remember an institutional decision of a people, including funds, government's decision to not a, a, a have conflict or diplomacy as we know that civil societies have, but to bomb pizza parlors, innocent families, families have been broken, destroyed, a generation traumatized. Between 93 and 2000, the Oslo Accords, which was basically the decision of the government of Israel to negotiate a, with the PLO, that's what brought Arafat back to the territories. Israel as a military leaves the major Palestinian cities. And we were met, of course, with endless terror attacks, brutal terror attacks against our people. 
I know it's long, but that's how long terrorism is. And that's what I want you to have in your mind. 2000 to 2004, that basically is what my childhood, including my father who was wounded in a terrorist attack was designed of, is the second intifada, the worst act of violence in the history of terrorism. You, the country came in to chaos that it wasn't only that you couldn't be on a bus, you couldn't stand next to a bus station. I know many of you visited Israel at that time. Every day, a terrorist attack bombed. And then we came basically to the biggest, um, biggest, biggest terrorist attack, which was, of course, the Park Hotel in Netanya, which made Israel 20 years ago today. We're, we're now actually, we're now actually memorying, memorying that in Passover to go into uh, uh, Operation Chomat Magin, a pillar of defense in which, uh, in which Israel was able to uh, recontrol, take, take control again of the Palestinian cities and destroy terrorism that was under the leadership of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon at that time. 2004, we go to the disengagement. Israel goes out of Gaza. What are we met with? Peace, the Singapore of the, of the Middle East that was promised. Of course not. We were met by endless missiles uh, that were sent um, into, into our southern border, uh, which of course makes life until this day chaotic for close to a million of Israelis. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. And then we meet the year 22. And that, my friends, is the context in which this is happening. Another wave of terrorism. But the root is the same root, although the way it's happening this time is a little different. It's not institutionalized terrorism. It's in a way much worse. It's lone terrorism. It's a guy who gets up in the morning and decides to go and kill Jews. He wasn't sent maybe by our organization, but don't be fooled by this rhetoric that's being told to you. A common person, you in Australia, me in my office here in Tel Aviv, doesn't wake up in the morning wanting to kill Jews. It is a part of a context of endless, endless a, a poison that is being given both in the mosques and in the end of the day, an economic incentive of the Palestinian Authority, the moderates, let me remind you, who are paying on a monthly basis a salary to every terrorist who committed an act of terror, a salary which is equivalent to the, to the minimum wage in the Palestinian Authority. This is the image that I want you to have before your eyes next time you see the journalists saying that these are freedom fighters, or next time you hear the people saying there's a random shooting in Tel Aviv, like I saw some of the reports. We cannot forget the context, because if we know the context, it's easier for us to act. Let's talk a little bit regarding uh, the organizations themselves. So basically, um, what we have, first of all, there's a lot, a lot of organizations. Uh, let's be very clear about that. Um, a lot of organizations. But what I try to give you is the general ones. The Palestinian, uh, there's a mistake that's being done worldwide. And that's that people disconnect the Palestinian issue by the, from the radical Islamic issue. In other words, we're seeing that the Middle East is the most brutal, murderous region in the world. Syria, Iraq, we saw what happened with ISIS. Suddenly we come to the Palestinians, we disconnect the, those terrible ideologies from them and say, you know, this is just a bunch of people who are part of a political dispute. No, it's the same, it's part of the same issue. The issue is that the marriage, and I, I'm not a person, of course, to, to generalize in the Islamic community, including here in Israel, some of them are our brothers serving with us in the army, in the police corps. Some of them were killed, Amir Khuli, were killed, murdered, while protecting Jews in, in, and securing the life, the everyday life here in Israel. But in the end of the day, we have three organizations, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, where, that are more on the Islamic side of the ideology, and the PLO who are the nationalists. Now, in, in Islam, and these are many studies that were done, it's a little different than, let's say, in Judaism. Nationalism doesn't mean secularism. Nationalism is also embodied with a lot of religion, and that's why the issue of Al-Aqsa, Harabayt, Haram al-Sharif, as they call it, is a big, big issue, even though they're secular nationalist the PLO. The PLO is who's running most of the territories in Judea and Samaria, that's Abu Mazen, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad are mostly an influence in Gaza, but have enormous, enormous influence also in, uh, in, uh, in Judea and Samaria. In fact, 
due to the fact that Gaza was destroyed in the last operation last May, I don't know if you remember, it's because of that that the Hamas was saying to itself, and that's the strategy now, and that's something important to know, okay, we're not going to attack from Gaza because Israel is giving us economic benefits there. They're finally opening the gates of Gaza to allow workers to come in. So we're going to do something else. We're going to incite our people in Judea and Samaria so that Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, how, how it's called by the international community at times, unfortunately, um, is, will, will pay the price, not Gaza. But it's the same Hamas. The PLO, the Fatah, who Abu Mazen wrote, wrote, of course, a doctorate about Holocaust denial, um, is perceived to be the moderate. Now, let me remind you, the Munich assassination, all the terrorist attacks that I talked to you about 1970 to 1987, the second intifada, that was not only Hamas. In fact, the second intifada was mostly the Fatah. It's not that they've become suddenly lovers of Zion and want to sing with us Kumbaya and sing a Tikva. Of course not. What they've done is they've changed their strategic thinking, and now they're cooperating with the IDF, trying to stop terrorism in one hand while paying terrorists in the other hand, playing a full game here. And all their, their needs are is they want to have their corrupt regime remain. And they realize because of the military operations that Israel takes to stop terrorism, that they can lose their governance. And it seems that they hate Jews, but they love money and corruption just a little more. And that's the reason why. So don't be fooled to, to think that we're in a world of moderates and extremists when it comes to the other side. Both sides take place in terrorism. Each side has a different strategy of how to achieve the goal. And Islamic Jihad is the more, uh, I would say, institutionalized Islamic movement in the Palestinian uh, in authority. Soon, I'll talk about, very soon, the identity of those who created the last atrocities in Israel. And you'll see that although they're not exactly a part of an organization, uh, of course they are influenced by them. Institutional terrorism, I call it the tale of two brutal intifadas. We can never, never forget. And unfortunately, you know, in human life is we have short and selective memories. But in the end of the day, the same Palestinians who are trying to come now to the international community and play victimhood and say that, you know, it, what they're doing is, is freedom fighters. They weren't the freedom fighters of Bar Kokhba fighting against the military. They weren't Menachem Begin fighting against the military. What they did through the years 2000 to 2004 was to target in those terrible and horrendous years our buses, our pizza parlors, our families, making life in Israel chaotic. And the question is why? The Palestinian strategy is you want to try and wear out Israeli society. That's why you actually terrorize them. The notion is, I terrorize them enough, life in Israel becomes chaotic, just as Nasrallah the Hezbollah said, we like death and they like life, and that's why we'll lose. Israelis leave or give up the Zionist dream or say that we should give up the Jewish state and then uh, become a binational state, therefore collapse uh, the collapse basically of the century's dreams to return to our land and have an identity nation state. That's the tactic. The tactic of murdering Jews was the same thing with Aaron Herschler, and it's the same thing uh, in these uh, intifadas and in those unbelievable horrendous years. What happened was, is that because the IDF did a very, very good and effective operation, terrorism was shifted, just like I explained to you about the Fatah, that they realized that they're ultimately going to lose. So they realized that if they can't destroy Israel from inside, and that is exactly has to do with the work of the Zionist Council on a daily basis, they realized if I can't destroy Israel from inside, I'll destroy them from outside. How? I'll get to that in the end of the presentation, because it touches, I think, what we need to do uh, on a daily basis. Now let's talk about the situation in Israel right now after understanding the context. Now we're in a different and many, many levels more complicated situation than we were. When it's institutionalized terrorism, then you basically know what you need to do to dismantle terrorists. You have to go into the institutions, to their leadership, destroy their leadership, protect our communities, 
and, and make the other side understand that there's a lot to lose. I am a man of peace also in my political views, but the Middle East, there's no place for the weak. That who will be weak will not exist. You have to be strong. That who wants peace, unfortunately, in this country needs to prepare on a daily basis for war. So the lone, sort of, the lone wolf terrorist, as I call it, phenomena, is very complicated. It started in 2016. What exactly is it? It started mostly in East Jerusalem. What you have is people who wake up in the morning, really do. They weren't sent by an organization per se. Sometimes they have economic issues, not always, by the way, that's another myth. Sometimes they have personal frustration, not always, that's a myth. Sometimes just like the murders that I showed you beforehand, sometimes they just hate Jews and don't think that we have a right to exist here. And they go and they stab someone. That, that was called the knife intifada, which took place in 2016. And I want you to remember this. The problem there is that our security forces are having a very, very hard time to deal with this. And why? And that's exactly what's happening now in the past few days. Because while institutional terrorism can be destroyed by, by strikes against facilities, here you need to try and understand what's in the brains and in the emotions of people, what's motivating them to act. And it's very, very hard to fight an emotion. And that's why it's so complicated. There is what to do about it. I'll get to it momentarily. So in the past few weeks, because we're coming close to the month of Ramadan, which is the holiest month in Islam, it always changes every year the date uh, due to the moon cycle, which is once how Judaism used to decide its holidays as well until we have a fixed calendar. Um, the incitement in the mosques become stronger and stronger because people are going to the mosques, mostly in Friday prayers. It starts with a prayer, but then an imam comes up. Unfortunately, imams not only in the Palestinian Authority, but also within Israeli Arab communities, and we'll talk about that, comes up, starts speaking, and in the end is talking, the Jews want to destroy Al-Aqsa, a new blood label, as if we're a moment from going up to the Temple Mount and blowing up what there is, is their third holiest place and our holiest place, just to remind you in terms of the categories of holiness in both religions. That incitement goes into the hearts and minds of people in ways that can't be imaginable. Social media, including international social media, gives the legitimacy, not only in the Palestinian Authority, but all throughout the world, like Bella Hadid on Instagram, gives them the legitimacy, the feeling that they're a part of something great. And out of that, you'll see the last uh, terrorist attacks. So it's the context of incitement, which happens through the month of Ramadan. It continues with a personal decision and the complexity of our security forces to do anything about it. So basically it started with a few stabbings, usually in Judea and Samaria and East Jerusalem. That unfortunately we got used to. What's different in the past few weeks, and this is the shift that one needs to notice, and that we really did not have since the Intifada, is that they're going in also to the major cities in Israel, Bnei Brak, Be'er Sheva, and of course the terrible incident in Tel Aviv. I was there meters from the terrorist attack. While the world lives a normal life, yes, COVID, which has become an issue for all of us, and I know, I know Sydney had it hard, but still everyday life is trying to is trying to get back to what it was. You need to imagine this is a, a picture from the from Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv. <laughs> to those of you, to those of you who haven't been there, Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv is our Fifth Avenue. It is the main main pillar of everyday life, of normal Israeli life. This doesn't happen in any country in the world in, to this extent. And even if it happens in the world, yes, there have been terrorist attacks worldwide, the silence, the shocking uttering silence of not talking about what's happening on a daily basis in our major cities means something very painful. The world has gotten used to it. It's gotten used to speaking in terminologies that are categorically not true. And due to that, we have a responsibility to not get used to it. We have a responsibility like this evening, I believe, to come together, learn about the history so that we can know also how to try and help with this in the future. And I think there's a way that you can. So it's from that history and from understanding what's happening on the ground today in Israel, which is basically fear in the streets. Every person next to you is a potential terrorist. People don't know what to do. And another change, unfortunately, is that some of the people who acted 
in, in these acts of terrorists were Israeli Arabs. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a full supporter of the inclusion of Israeli Arabs in every aspect of Israeli life. Yes, we are a strong Jewish state, but we're also a democracy. And we're obligated to have, to have full civil rights, maybe not national life, rights, like the right of return, obligated to have full civil rights for our Arab minority. However, the situation <clears throat> since last May, where when Israel striked in Gaza, cities in Israel, Akko, Lod, these are not Palestinian territories, violence began going to the street, weapons firing at Israelis is bringing a horrendous complicated situation here in Israel that now we're not only dealing with a foreign entity and enemy, we're dealing with citizens of our country who are collaborating with our enemy. Not all are citizens. It's important for me to say and iterate, not all. But in these last attacks, some of them were Israeli Arab citizens, not only Palestinians. That's another change from previous, um, from previous um, uh, engagements and terrorist engagements, but it's important for me uh, to say. I think the conclusion of the historic background that I tried to give you is, is that it's very easy to, uh, to sort of break every single uh, misconception that I think there is when it comes to Palestinian terrorism in Israel. Number one, that it's a territorial dispute. That's a, a classic thing I heard all over colleges, all over college campus. The funny thing about it is the Palestinians don't say it's a territorial dispute. That's what's so funny. It has become a conversation within ourselves, within the Jewish world, within the Israeli society and the international community when the perpetrators of the terrorism are not saying it's about the 1967 border. They're saying it's about the one and only Jewish state to have a right to exist in any borders. It's about an idea, not only about a territory. And if we don't understand what the problem is, our capacity to solve it will be much, much uh, uh, harder. That it's a national dispute. That's part, it's true. They do have some national claims and, and I'll give them that. But to say that the Palestinian issue of terrorism is disconnected by terrorism worldwide is again another lie. It's again that double standard and, and, and manipulation of the international community that's trying to say, yes, there's terrorism in the Middle East, but Israel is different. No, it isn't different. Butchering in Iraq is similar to butchering in Israel. Both come from the lack of legitimization that radical Islam has towards anybody who thinks different from them. It could be a Jewish state and it could be a Sunni in a Shiite country and, by, and vice versa. Another claim said all over social media, I didn't make this up and I'm in social media. I know what young people are saying in TikTok, that these are freedom fighters, that these are Nelson Mandela's who wasn't a great friend of ours, of course, but was a hero of, our, of his generation. A, in, that these are freedom fighters, you know, this William Wallace of Scotland fighting, no, it's not freedom fighters. It is a religious war that hates Jews and believes that they have no claim for the land of Israel. That's what it is. It is an anti-Zionist battle, an anti-Jewish battle taking place in the Middle East. And it doesn't end ultimately in the Middle East. As you know, it gets until Munich in the 1970s and until the United States in 2001. Yes, it's different manifestations, but the root remains the same. Another claim is the moral equivalence one. We attack them, they attack us. It's just two bad people fighting each other. History proves us differently. While we were willing to accept, and I'm not saying we're perfect, we did mistakes, including with the Palestinians, but while we were willing to accept in almost every historic time a compromise, the other side met it with violence. You saw that on the timeline, that after Oslo, when we let them back into the Palestinian cities and gave them weapons, they used those weapons for the most brutal terrorist attacks against, their, against Israel. The underdog theory, as if the other side is the underdog and we're the strong. Yes, militarily, we're the strong one. But this, this, that doesn't tell you something about morality. One can't judge a moral issue based on who's stronger. One needs to judge a moral issue based on who's right. And that's something that social media, including young Jews, are getting wrong on a daily basis. Affiliation, it's natural to affiliate with that who's perceived to be weak. The question is not why is the Palestinian innocent person weak? The question is why is his leadership continuing to do acts of terrorism? You want to be a, a treated like human beings, act like human beings, 
and, the, and starting by not terrorizing and murdering innocent women and children and, chil and, and, and men, of course, in the land of Israel. Another issue which I touched base on is the separation between Palestinian terrorism and the region. In other words, I, I, as I explained, people are saying there's Palestinians and there's the rest of the region. I tried to explain why that's not exactly the case. Another theory is the moderate and extremist, right? If the battle is between extremist Jews and extremist Palestinians on the other side. Yes, there's extremist Jews who we need to condemn. There is no proportion between a couple hundred extremist Jews who are in a few mountains in Samaria to institutionalize hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of Palestinians who aspire to, to, to murder Jews and who've proven that they're willing to do so in the intifadas, which wasn't done by a few, by a few extremists. It was manifested by their government, by Yasser Arafat at the time, and later on Abu Mazen, who today is the leader. Um, another issue is that terrorists are poor and in lower social income status. Sometimes that's the case. It isn't always the case. The person who did the terrorist attack in Beersheba two weeks ago drove on the Mercedes. He was from one of the strongest economic um, um, households in the Bedouin community and strongest, um, strongest uh, um, villages that exists there. It's not always the case. There is other reasons. By the way, ISIS collapsed that theory completely. People always used to say that terrorism comes in the vacuum of poverty. Someone doesn't have any hope, so he looks for any ideology so he can have hope in life. Um, ISIS, statistically, the most people who were inspired by ISIS were actually part of the middle class in England, United States, and other places. Uh, Jihadi Joan, the person who did the horrendous videos at the time, was a student at the London film uh, at the London Film School. That's the reasons his videos were so effective and so professional. And the, the last misconception is the root of the conflict, and that touches uh, basically everything in the narrative that I was trying to show you. The root of the conflict, the reason for terrorism. We always find a different excuse. There always comes in different forms, but the root has always been from the days of Aaron Herschler till today, the lack of acceptance of the other side for a Jewish state to live in any border or in any area of the land of Israel. And that's something that's, it's not simplistic. It's just a categorical truth. One that that timeline by itself, I think can prove. And of course, if anybody disagrees, you're welcome, of course, uh, to challenge that. And now this is something that's important for me specifically for all of you in communities worldwide that I feel a great affiliation for and see all of you as my brothers and sisters. Young people we know are distancing themselves from Israel. Mostly I think, as I told you, and that's my separate lecture because of the issue of identity. What people need to be exposed to is not only the facts about Israel, that's good and it's wonderful for an intellectual debate, which is important. What they need to be experiencing is the story of Israel. And I want you to look at these faces. These are the faces, maybe even coming close to Yom Hazikaron, which also, as I told you, commemorates the fallen and terrorist attacks. These, these people tell the story of Israel that we want young people and all Jews worldwide to know. We don't want them only to see Israel as a cacao box in the synagogue or the boring shaliach who comes to Mariah College wonderful as he, may be, as he may be, spewing the same terminologies time and again. And I think that's why it's so important what the Zionist Council does. We want them to see an image of Israel, the story that shows the microcosmos of what Israeli society is, the good of it. A person like Amir Khouli, an Arab Muslim cop who did everything to protect ultra-Orthodox Jews in Bnei Brak. Shir El, two childhood friends, who came back from reserve duty, where I was last week, went to a bar in Tel Aviv to, to celebrate their friendship and were murdered together, as it says in the Bible, in their lives and in their deaths, they weren't separated. There are stories behind the timelines that I show you. Now, why I think this is important, because rather than always having young people in the world look at Israel from victimhood point of view, Let's learn of the lives of these people because their life story is the story of Israel. That's the story we want people to connect to. We always have to come with two pillars. The two pillars that I wanted uh, to give you here today, the historic, rational, and intellectual pillar, 
but also the personal people to people pillar, the place where we can find a face, connect to, and that will be the story of Israel for each and every one of us. So it's important for me that you think about these people, that you think about their stories, that you study about them, they've been written up, and that maybe someone you connect to, maybe someone who is telling you Israel isn't inclusive, Israeli society is racist, have them look at these people, these beautiful young souls who lost their lives in, in, more than, in a context of more than 100 years of terrorizing of Israelis. And you'll see, I'm sure, another pillar, another aspect of Israeli society that can help connect people. If they connect to Israelis, it's much easier for them to connect to Israel itself. I want to start concluding, and then I'm going to give a short synopsis. I think we're okay on time regarding time. A very short synopsis also about the political situation in Israel to say that terrorism ultimately has failed. They thought that they would be able, all the wars of Israel were designed to think that you can destroy the Jewish entity and the Jewish state here in Israel due to our strong military, due to the fact that Israel is the strongest in the region, due to the fact that we have a strong Jewish community worldwide that hopefully will continue backing us, that will not, that will not succeed. Yes, they can make our life chaotic, but they cannot destroy it. So they've now shifted, and that's why it's important for me. To, to explain to you what they're doing. They're saying to themselves now, if I can't destroy Israel from inside, I'm going to do everything to destroy Israel from outside. And that's the vacuum in which BDS, which was created in 2001 after the Durban conference, a, a, comes into. The BDS, all the anti-Israel diligemanizations, dilema, it's a hard word. I don't know why it's always pretty hard. I'm saying it a thousand years already. But the, the reason that that happened is the same reason that there's terrorism, just a different tactic. Now they're saying it will be an international campaign that will destroy Israel from outside because we couldn't destroy Israel from inside. It is strategic. It is well-funded. It is being thought about especially in social media. It's targeting data of young people worldwide and telling them that Israelis are animals, that the IDF is terrible, that the Palestinians are freedom fighters, all the misconceptions I talked to you about. And the BDS needs to be seen, not only BDS, all the organizations, all the anti-Israel sentiment needs to be seen in that context as a continued process of terrorism, which took a shift to the international arena, and the international arena unfortunately is buying it due to many reasons, as it's someone who served in the UN, I can explain in a different time, is buying into so that they can destroy Israel from outside Israel's idea, make life by boycotting it so impossible in Israel that we would have to change our identity and cease being a Jewish state. So don't forget that when it comes to the BDS, that it, you should envision it on the same timeline, even though people aren't dying and there, that there is a difference, but strategically, it has the exact same goal and aim that terrorism has. So how can we all have an impact? And I know what I'm gonna say now will sound to many of you as if it doesn't matter. I don't accept that. I think every single person can do whatever he can in his territory so that we can try and make a difference because the alternative is to do nothing. One, we have to expose in social media and the media the truth, the truth being both what's happening on the ground and, of course, in, in the, the lying that the press has and the lack of context that they're doing. It is important for you to post on social media. There are great organizations that are promoting great content that help understand it's not Hezbollah per se, it's not like some propaganda. It's real, real intellectual material. And if we can get to young people who are influence, influencers, social media influencers, like I try to do here on a daily basis, who get to hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, if you know someone like that, and if you convince him to, to have an ad that counters the anti-Israel rhetoric that you see, then it will have an effect on Israel's public perception worldwide. And if it will have an, a, a perception on, on the public perception, then the dangers of BDS become lower and lower. And also let us not forget that BDS isn't only a danger for Israel. It's a danger for Jewish identity worldwide because it makes our young people being ashamed and embarrassed of who they are and make them run away from their identity. And if they run away from Israel, we know chronically they run away from Judaism. 
And the other aspect is the lobby. I know that many of you are extremely, extremely influential in Australia and elsewhere. It's important that we go to the members of parliament, that we remind them of what's happening, that we try, make them tweet in support of Israel and against terrorism. Those tweets will be retweeted worldwide and give an understanding to the enemy that they're not breaking us domestically and they're not breaking us internationally. Those are the pillars that each and every one of us can influence in. We may think it doesn't make a difference, but we know very, very well, and many of you are innovators, and here in Startup Nation, we see that every person doing his best can make uh, an important impact. So if I'm to summarize this a, a part of my lecture, and then I'm just gonna give two minute brief about something else. It was important for me, for you to understand the realities here, not only from the point of view of one terror attack, that happened in Dizengov and a terror attack in Bnei Brak and a terror attack in Beersheba. I want to show you the pattern, the pattern that can make us understand what the real problem is. And we, when we understand that, then we have the material to counter attack anti-Israel rhetoric. I will also tell you that I hope that in the upcoming Yom HaZikaron, that I know is a beautiful event there, I assume it will be in Mariah again, one of the most compelling and beautiful events that I had at the time when I was invited by the council and, and my dear friends, Nomi and Richard, in that you'll, you'll remember the names. You'll remember the names also for their deaths and the tragedy and that we need to do everything to protect our one and only Jewish state, but also learn of their identities. Because if we learn of their identities, we have a new lens of Israel, a new lens for young people who are looking for a new language, who are looking to first connect with people and, only co and then connect with ideas. If they connect with Israelis, with the stories of their victims, then they have a face, and that face is the beauty of Israel. That um, is the first uh, pillar of, of, you know, of what I want to speak about. I want briefly, and then, uh, and then we'll end, I want um, deeply to, um, very briefly to tell you about the political uh, situation here in Israel and why I think that has an effect as well on, uh, on realities on the ground. Due to, a, again, identity politics, which is very complicated, but I'll, I'll say in one minute, basically there are three camps in Israel. There is the right-wing camp, there is the center-left camp, and there is the anti-Netanyahu, pro-Netanyahu camp, which is, which is basically four. And that has made our political system crazy. It has created a government which is basically a mutation, a mutation between nationalist, religious, right-wingers, and the Islamic movement from the other side run by Mansour Abbas. In the past few weeks, uh, um, in the past week, Edith Silman, uh, who was a member of Bennett's party, due also to pressure and, and political pressure, left the coalition, leaving the coalition without 61 votes. Now, what does this mean? It means one of two. A non-confident vote will be brought to the Knesset a few weeks from now. And when the non-confident vote will be brought in, um, we don't really know what will happen. Because the question is, will the Arab party back the coalition, the Arab party that's in the opposition, not Mansour Abbas, who's in the, in the coalition, but the Arab party who's outside of it, will they back the coalition and therefore, um, and, and therefore save the coalition, or will we go to elections? Why I think this is interesting, and it has to do, I think, also with politics in Australia, is because one, you cannot disconnect one from the other. Terrorism and unrest in the streets comes many times together with unrest in our political system. When our enemy sees that we are divided, when our enemy sees how chaotic our political system is, that's the vacuum in which they want to attack. But Israeli society, unfortunately, is unfortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, 80% of Israelis agree on almost everything. They agree that, they, that there isn't anyone to talk to on the other side. They agree that we need to be strong in the Middle East, each one with its own nuances. So what's left is tribal affiliation and an anti bb or pro bb sentiment. And that has made our political system so crazy. And so we need to see what, what it comes forth. But it's important for me, when you look at the players, to remember two camps. There is the national camp that always goes together with the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, not because the ultra-Orthodox are right-wing, by the way, but because they, the right-wing was always perceived to be more traditional 
on a, uh, on, a, on, the, on a Jewish level, what we, one would call it. So they don't affiliate with the left, even though in terms of Judea and Samaria, they, they are a little more uh, to the left. And the other side, which is the left, is going together with Lieberman. Lieberman, whose voters are right-wing, many of them come from, uh, from Soviet Union countries and from Russia. And they are left-wing when it comes to issues of religion and state, issues like uh, um, in, you know, a Giyu, which I lost the English, uh, English uh, name of conversion, sorry. Issues like conversion and issues like things being open on Shabbat. So it's created a tension between his national views and his civil, or civil views. And that's the system that we are in now. It seems that there is a very good chance that we're going to election a few weeks from now when the Knesset comes back from session. However, I will tell you that I'm not sure that we're there. And many are saying that we're not sure they're there yet. There may be a government that's run by a minority because when it comes to the non-confident votes, because of their own politics and interests, the Arab party will try to save them from them back. So remember political unrest and security unrest, but also optimism. Optimism to look at the beauty of Israeli society in the past few days, try to resonate and connect with that. So I hope this context helped. In, on, on some levels and gives us the ability to also open now the conversation to questions and conversation. Thank you.